And joining us now, Dr. Stephen Scherer. He is director of the Center for Applied Genomics at the Hospital for Sick Children, and we're happy to have you in that chair tonight. How are you? Oh, very good, thank you. I want to start by talking about this group that you're a part of, I guess a consortium of about 120 scientists, 11 countries, looking into the genetic risk factors for autism. What's the main bullet point that you've found out so far? Well, we now know, really for the first time, we have definitive evidence that genes can cause autism. Uh, it's been known for many years that studies of um, families and identical twin studies have indicated that perhaps 90% of what leads to autism uh, maps back to genetic factors. And about three years ago, we first identified some of the genes that are actually involved. You say some of the genes, because I guess the assumption may have been it's probably the same gene replicated many times over that everybody has, but that's not the case, right? It's a different one for every person, per perhaps? The, the short answer is we've now identified uh, six genes that um, if you only have one copy instead of the typical two copies, you have a very high risk of being autistic. But we also have evidence that perhaps there's over 100 different genes that can lead to autism. But what's really interesting, um, about a decade ago, <clears throat> the focus of, of research really was to investigate uh, common genetic variations. The idea was that there would be uh, common forms of DNA sequences that predispose to developing autism. But in fact, what we've now unveiled in the last three years or so, using new technologies, that uh, each individual who has autism or a genetic form of autism probably has their own type of genes involved. Mm. So they're kind of like snowflakes in a way that uh, autism is very unique um, and each individual has their own genetic composition, if you will. When you started your research, were you under the assumption that there would just be one gene that you'd have <clears throat> to look for? Uh, I say the, the, the majority of the community was, but in fact, we built our whole program um, looking in the other direction, so trying to uh, identify these rare variants. So when you found out it's actually potentially <clears throat> hundreds that you're looking for, did you smack your head and go, oh, no? Uh, no. Uh, the problem we had in the past is we didn't have a technology that allowed us to look at a high enough resolution to find all of these rare uh, genetic variations. But in fact, uh, in June of this, this past year, we used new technologies and we published a scientific manuscript where we identified um, something in the order of 100 different genes. And what was really unique in our finding was that, and if you look at the molecules that these genes encode, the proteins in the cell, they're all involved in the same biochemical pathways. So in fact, while you can have a unique genetic profile, if you will, the genes that are making proteins are all working together. So in fact, there may be common targets for therapeutics, which is very exciting. We're, we're taking a head and shoulder shot of you right now, and I just wonder if I could ask, uh, Michael, can you just open up the shot a little bit, get that lapel pin, and then zoom in on it, because everybody at home is going to be asking me, why is he wearing that puzzle piece on his left lapel? And uh, obviously, you're looking for the missing piece of the puzzle, I'm guessing. That's what it's about, right? We're looking for the missing pieces of the puzzle, yes. Missing pieces. Yes. Uh-huh. And you're going to wear one of them on your lapel and <clears throat> remind yourself that that's what you're about every day. That's right, yes. Gotcha. Okay. What has your research revealed about the extent to which environmental factors, not genetics, plays into autism? Well, so, so far we can account for the genetic basis of autism in about 15% of individuals who have a diagnosis. Okay, so if you take 100 people off the street who have an autism diagnosis, we can identify the cause in about 15% of those cases. Um, with respect to environment, we don't have that many uh, examples where we know specific environmental agents are involved. There are some um, uh, examples of thalid thalidomide mm -hmm. and valproic acid being involved, uh, birth complications, but perhaps this accounts for less than 1%. But once we identify the genes, uh, we have targets to do these experiments to see which environmental agents or toxins may influence these genes. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll be able to step back and more rationally define really what the role of genes and environment and how they interact with each other. But genetics at 15 percent, I'm guessing you think that's, that's a pretty low number. You'd like that to be a lot higher. Well, we're just scratching the surface. This is what we can see right now. As our technologies get better and, and we're really poised to that point now, we'll be able to probably account for 80, 90, 80 to 90 percent of the causes with genes. Within what period of time? We're looking at five years. The uh, technology now allows us to sequence the entire genome. If you remember the Human Genome Project, it cost about $3 billion to generate a consensus sequence of a group of individuals. We can now do that experiment in my laboratory for $12,000. Uh, by the end of next year, we're anticipating it will be $4,000, and we're embarking on a project to sequence uh, the DNA from 1,000 individuals with autism. 
you must deal with parents mm -hmm. of autistic children all the time. What kind of feedback are you getting from them based on what you've now told us tonight? So we study the DNA from individuals with autism. I, I'm a scientist and we, we try to interact with the families as much as we can because they're the, the best people to help us focus the questions that we're asking, the scientific questions. But we're also finding answers for the questions that they're asking us. Uh, so we have to deliver that information back to, their <clears throat> to the families through, the, through their physicians. What kind of feedback do you get from them? So far, it's all been positive. The, the families want answers. They want information. They want um, data that helps them make decisions about their children and their lives. And we've been very fortunate that in the last few years with these genetic breakthroughs, we can start to provide some answers. Here is the kind of tough ethical question that I know you have to think about in your job <clears throat> and that lots of people think about. How concerned are you that somewhere down the road, companies will begin to develop uh, genetic screening tests that will conclusively indicate whether or not a fetus is likely to become an autistic young boy or girl, and that people will make family planning decisions, quote unquote, based on that information? Uh, well, I, it's already happening now. Um, I mentioned the 15% number. There are technologies called gene chips or microarrays that uh, are run regularly in private sector and hospitals um, that do this type of testing. Now, most of the testing is postnatal. Uh, the testing is to, for confirmation, but also uh, for early identification, which is really, really critical. But certainly the same information can be used in a prenatal setting, too. Uh, I think the, the, um, uh, the wording you use of absolute confirmation or prediction is that's the real trick here. Autism is very, very complex. And even though we have identified some of these autism risk genes, uh, it's often it's very pr difficult to predict what the outcome will be. Will it be severe autism? where children have uh, severely um, disabilities mm -hmm. uh, versus something like Asperger's syndrome uh, or something in between. It's very hard to predict what the outcome will be. So today's tests are not very conclusive on that front. Uh, uh, well, they're not right now, and I don't know that they're going to get any better. We can, we can give a good indication that if you're missing, say, one copy of this gene, you may have autism or something that looks like autism or a neuropsychiatric disorder. Uh, and this is very important, primarily for early uh, early prediction and, and early intervention. Hmm. The, the, I've, you know, you've heard this argument with deaf people um, where they say we don't want to find a cure for deafness because there is a whole culture uh, around deaf people that would be lost if suddenly everybody could hear. Do you hear that in reference to autistic people as well, that we don't want to find out, you know, we don't want an end to autistic people because there is something special or different or distinctive that comes with being autistic? Well, absolutely, and, and uh, I think what, what people really need to understand is, is autism is a collection of disorders. I mentioned there's hundreds of genes involved. It, it looks like perhaps there's, it's a really a grouping of hundreds of different disorders that have a common clinical endpoint or endpoints. So when you talk about something that can have an outcome that's very, very severe, that's debilitating for the individual and the family, particularly the family, um, compared to something that is, uh, say, Asperger's syndrome. Some people think that Albert Einstein had Asperger's and, uh, you know, autistic children used to be called little professors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you're talking to uh, one end of the spectrum, it doesn't really apply to the other end of the spectrum. So we have to be very careful. I think communication is one of the core uh, uh, clinical definitions of autism. We also have to be very careful when we communicate the information to policymakers and families and, and funders, uh, for example. So uh, the short answer is I think there's no, there's no simple answer. Mm. You have to be able to deliver the information to the family, educate them, and then let them make the decisions. They're the ones who know how to best use this information. Can, can you break it down for us? Can you tell us of, of the people in, in this province or this country today who suffer from autism, what percentage would be you know, highly functional, very able to <clears throat> you know, perform routine tasks in society, and those who really uh, you know, have an extremely difficult time coping? So there's no simple answer to this. This is like a, every, <laughs> everything in That's going to be your answer to everything today. Well, no, the simple tell. answer in autism is that everything's complex. Yeah, right. right. Um, but in fact, uh, I actually consulted on this topic this morning, and, and I, I think 50% uh, or so uh, fall into the, the severe category, um, severe what we call severe autism, whereas high-functioning, uh, for lack of a better term, or Asperger's and... Um, uh, would be another 50 percent. Those numbers are changing all the time. There's really no comprehensive study yet, but I think that's probably a good estimate. And for the 50 percent that are severe, uh, does that, and I mean, does that encapsulate everything from consistently banging your head against the wall to you know, lying motionless? I don't know. You tell me. What's the what's the range? 
Right, so, so the, the definition of autism is it's a neurodevelopmental condition that has a characteristic core deficit in three domains of function, namely communication, repetitive and stereotypic behaviors, and social interaction skills. Uh, but the, the range is, is quite, quite wide. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard one parent of an autistic boy describe autism as having a child stuck in their terrible twos, their worst terrible twos tantrum, 24-7 and multiply it by 100. Hmm. Okay, so that's what we typically think of an autistic disorder. And then on the other end of the spectrum is something like Asperger's. Um, uh, so, so if you fit these three core um, uh, domains of, of function, these, these characteristics, then you have a diagnosis of autism. Uh, I think what's really interesting is most of our statistics around research studies and prevalence frequencies are looking at this very stringently defined definition of autism, yet there are a lot of people walking around who have maybe one or two of these different aspects. And in fact, many people are quite surprised when they hear that when we look at families, uh, in about maybe 20% or more of families, one of the parents have what's called a broader autism phenotype. So they have a kind of a mild form of autism. Uh, and then if you look out even beyond that, it's even more prevalent in the population. So all of our genetic statistics and data is derived at looking uh, at this uh, more uh, complex autistic disorder, so we call it. But uh, we're now initiating studies to look in the broader population to see what's going on at the genetic level. Now, hold that thought for a second, because I'm going to go there in a sec. But just w one thing that is not complex, I think, is the gender breakdown, right? It's overwhelmingly male, <clears throat> right? What percentage uh, right. so, are men and what so percentage? Right, so pretty much every study shows that it's four to one uh, male to female gender bias. Hmm. OK, the Ontario government's just given you, what is it, eight million bucks to run a DNA scan on nearly every child diagnosed with autism in the province, is that right? Yes, uh, that through, through, well, through a very uh, competitive peer review grant process, uh, we, we won. I didn't mean <laughs> to suggest otherwise, yes, <laughs> we, we won a, a very generous grant from the Ministry of Research and Innovation, uh, which is gonna put, I think, uh, Ontario at the, at, the, at the lead in the research, uh, genetics certainly worldwide. And what are you gonna do? So the next uh, four years, we're, we will be running 8,000 DNA samples, uh, essentially from probably every individual, hopefully, who has an autism diagnosis in this province on these uh, gene microarrays that allow us to scan their genomes at a very high resolution um, and, and see if we can discover new genes, but also uh, apply the information to benefit the families. So this is beyond just getting a blood sample from all these people. This is serious. You tell me what the right expression is. Mean, I would say seriously high tech, but you're going to say something else. Th this is, say? well, seriously high tech, that's just the first step. That's to actually help us get, um, to get much better uh, idea of, of, the, of the, uh, the complex nature of the clinical presentation of autism. But in fact, the, the second aim of our grant is to sequence the genomes of a thousand of these autistic individuals. So mm -hmm. this is using uh, really, a, let's see, cutting edge technologies, the latest technology, um, to study the DNA uh, from start to finish. Highest resolution, it's not gonna get any better than this uh, from a thousand individuals. And we have a, a partner group in the US who are doing a thousand. Uh, so this is gonna, uh, I think, increase from maybe 15% uh, to hopefully up to 50, 60% uh, to identify these, these genes that are involved. Over what period of time are you gonna be doing this? Well, we've we officially started October 1st and it will be going for the next five years. Five years, okay. Apart from testing, what do you hope uh, this research will be able to reveal um, in terms of how you're going to treat people who've got autism going forward? Well, so, so the, I, I think the important point to, to emphasize is we're already there because we know for 15% we, we can give them an explanation. Okay, so the important thing is, is uh, early identification is the most critical component of having success in early in intervention therapies. So you need to start early. And if these genes that we've already identified are the ones we're going to find in the next five years are the ones that are culprit, we can tell the family at day one that they, this child should be watched. And if they start to move in that direction, they, there needs to be early intervention. Secondly, we're finding uh, there's often many uh, other medical complications associated with autism. And the, this, having this genetic um, scan attached to the clinical description allows us to much better define that. In some cases, uh, lead to life-saving treatments because these types of genetic changes we're finding often hit more than one gene. So you can have autism and say some uh, congenital heart abnormality or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is surprising. Perhaps up to 20% of cases uh, have some type of a additional 
medical complication. And thirdly, and I think this is most importantly for the broader community, in particular uh, adults who have autism, for the very first time now that we have the genes identified, or some of them, um, we can identify targets to rationally design therapeutics. And these didn't exist three years ago. Um, so, you know, people were, there were companies, a few, not many working on this, who are trying to design drugs, but they were aiming them at a black box. They didn't really know what, you know, how to do the experiments. Uh, and just in the last couple of years, I've been very encouraged in that almost every single major pharmaceutical has started uh, drug development programs around the gene discoveries that uh, our group and others have made in the last few years. Uh, and coupling that to the increased uh, prevalence frequency of autism. I think it's caught the public attention and uh, pressure from the families and advocacy groups. Um, this has become a major uh, investment area for drug development. And, I, I, and you know, there's good targets there. I, I can really see that something will come in the next few years. In which case, we'll have you back, and maybe you'll be wearing a different puzzle piece then, because you've you will have discovered what the that one represents. Complete puzzle, I hope. Yeah, uh, Stephen Chair, it's good of you to join us tonight here on TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.